behind me. Right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the general meeting of the 9th of May. Um, very nice to have you all on. We're nearly at 100 people, which is fantastic. We do have a lot to cover today. Um, and just so to run you through the agenda, a very, very quick update on the community. I'm going to talk about the survey and get Alison to talk about that. Um, we're then very, very pleased, and I will obviously will introduce Dave properly when we get there, to have Dave Evans, who is the CEO of CDISC, to come and talk to us a little bit about CDISC and the standards in clinical trials. Mary from Eminor from Pfizer is going to talk about an update on, on where we are with the implementation. And then I'm going to give you a very, very brief insight into the workshop that we did on the impact of the EU CTR on TMF content and process. However, there is, a, there is a link in the chat that Eldon put up to the YouTube. It'll be on the website as well. It's a two hour, so you need a big bottle of wine for that. But it's, um, it, it is actually quite interesting because it gives you quite a lot of insight into people's thoughts around um, EU CTR and the impact on the TMF. And then upcoming meetings and the next reference model meeting. So let's talk very quickly, the community, as you know, we have a steering committee of 14 or on the website who's there, most of them are on the call today. Uh, we then have 333 active members. Um, and I will talk, we'll talk a little bit about the membership and the transition to, um, uh, to, to CDISC at some stage. Um, we've got 1628 people on the website, so subscribers. And we have a LinkedIn community of 4,000 people. And we're still managing to get away without having people doing too much advertising or recruiting or putting nonsense onto the, the LinkedIn group. So it's a very clean community. So I'd like to now hand over to Alison just to talk a little bit about the reference model survey that's just been launched. So Alison, over to you. Sure. Hi. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank everyone that has taken the time to complete the survey. I don't have the numbers just yet where we are. Um, and, uh, you know, this is an opportunity for everyone. We want to get your perspective. We want to make sure you're heard. And this information is super valuable. You've seen these. And this is, I think, our ninth survey or something like that. So we, we use these surveys uh, and share this information out with all of our colleagues in the industry. So it's very valuable information. Uh, so if you have a few minutes, we really uh, encourage you to, to take the survey. It does close on June, uh, June 30th. So you do have a little bit of time. Um, it doesn't take long to complete either. It's uh, pretty easy to complete. I do have to say, I apologize. There are questions in there that say, please submit as many answers that apply. Uh, there's a few of those questions. The, that feature is not working. Uh, and unfortunately, we since we published it, we can't go back and fix it. So the best uh, advice that I could give that when I took it myself was to select other. And then I specified those two or three items that, uh, that applied to that question for me. Um, we've provided the QR code here for anyone uh, that needs it. Um, and thanks again, and uh, uh, please fill out the survey. I know, I know. Thank you very much, Alison. And thank you to everybody who's been involved. And I'd also like to thank CDISC who stepped in very quickly to get it released on, on, on MailChimp. And so we really appreciate that as well. There is a QR code on your screen. So take a second, grab your phone and zap the QR code. And then you can do the survey. Brilliant. OK, so. The next thing for us to talk about is CDISC. And we are very, very delighted to have Dave Evans, who has joined us um, as who is the president and CEO of CDISC. And he's joining us today just to give a little bit of an insight into CDISC and into using standards in clinical trials. I will do a pitch to say that on the 27th of June, we're actually going to be running a full scale webinar where we delve into this in much greater detail. Um, and we'll be bringing the TMF reference model and the CDIS community together for that. Um, I also want to say that um, Dave has been a huge support in terms of patience and answering questions and helping us get to this point. So we've been working with Dave for the last year. 
Um, and we're very, very excited. So Dave, can I hand to you and just Great. tell me what you need to move slides on? Great, thanks, Karen. Uh, first off, uh, thanks to you and the TMF Steering Committee for your patience as we went through this past year. And I'm so sorry that I did get to meet you all in person down in New Orleans, uh, but um, maybe next time I will be able to come down there. So Karen, if you go on the next slide. Um, so CDISC, uh, I'm gonna give you just a brief background on CDISC if you don't know it already, but our mission is to develop and support global platform independent data standards that enable information system interoperability to improve medical research and related areas of healthcare. Our found, founding came some 22 years ago as a DIA group uh, back in the late 90s, in which a group of us or a dozen or so of us that came together to to uh, figure out how to exchange data among ourselves in a standard way. That then grew into the endeavor of creating the CDISC standards and thus the submission to regulatory agencies. Uh, what we've certainly, that was a volunteer group in the initial stages, but now we are a, a formal organization, have been a formal organization for now almost 20 years. And we're a global nonprofit uh, standards development organization. I'll change the word to mean more now standards governance organization because we're taking on other standards that have already been developed and maintaining them and governing them. We certainly have this 20 years of regulatory clinical data standards development and implementation aspect. CDISC is, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, is moving from just the development of standards onto the implementation and the governance of them. We have an experienced leadership team. I have 40 plus individuals, uh, professionals that, that support the organization. We have a equal amount of consultants and subject matter experts that we employ for uh, special projects that go on. For instance, one of the projects that we have going on right now is with the Center for Tobacco Products, in which we're developing the standards for Center for uh, Nicotine Harm Reduction for the Center for Tobacco. And thus we bring in experts from the, from the industry in order to supplement our expertise. We have a volunteer network of a thousand plus. It, it's growing, it grows every day, it grows every week. Uh, certainly we deploy the volunteers on the standards as needed and, and where they're needed, not just the foundational standards, but also special therapeutic area standards or special interest standards. We have 542 members um, as of Friday. Um, they uh, range from small biotech to large pharma to regulatory agencies, to academic institutions, to vendor community. Um, and, and actual um, outside of our industry that we have some member companies. Um, we're widely adopted and freely available clinical research data standards. You all know that. We have this mature standards governance process that we have used and, and, and maintained and grown over time. Uh, it's recognized uh, among all the formal standards organizations that are out there that we qualify as a global standards organization. <clears throat> we also have this innovative open source technology for standards library and metadata management. And one of the things that came out as we grew over time is we had to move beyond documents, move beyond spreadsheets and move into something that then could be consumed by both humans and machines in order to ensure that standards are, uh, data standards are utilized and conform, the data actually conforms to the standards. So we, we took it on ourselves and our investments uh, in order to develop a, essentially a metadata repository and registry of this information that is available. And I'll get to that in a little bit. <clears throat> we are also involved in a wide range of emerging industry initiatives and projects. I mentioned the Center for Tobacco Products. But we're also involved with IMI and IHI in Europe on device standards and COVID standards. Uh, we released uh, a vaccine administration uh, standard. You can think of that as the data that goes behind a um, vaccine uh, passport. Uh, we put that out to the community and a number of the um, digital passports took that up as the standard. Most importantly, I'd say we have this collaborative ecosystem of relationships and partners, 
partnerships from our members, from regulators, patient foundations, academia, other standards development organizations in the industry. Uh, this uh, next slide, please, Karen. This alliance and collaboration is could be graphically represented as this, in which we have regulatory collaborations on the right hand side that also then feeds into therapeutic area partnerships in which we look at standards for certain indications or patient therapeutic areas. And we then engage with the foundations, the, the trusts. Um, you think of uh, the Helmsley Foundation and the Gates and Welcome Trust uh, in which we work with them to develop therapeutic area standards for sp specific disease states. We have some 50 plus therapeutic area guides that are in place right now. And then uh, the foundational part of this graph graphic is that we work with the other standards organizations like HL7 and IHE and ISO. And uh, they're all, we're all part of a collaborative called the Joint Initiative Council in which we make sure that there's harmonization between the various standards that are used within our, within our industry, not just uh, clinical research, but also in the healthcare industry. And then as we have a special relationship with FUSE, which is um, essentially an implementation of standards for statistical and analysis use. And they grew up, have grown up alongside of CDISC. So next slide, please. Um, before I do, Dave, I just want to say that for me, this is one of the most exciting parts about this collaboration because we've struggled to really engage with the different organizations. You know, when ICH E6R3 comes out and people get pulled to the table, we didn't. We sort of have to go in through the back ways because through our members. And I think for me, this is putting the TMF right out center and front with the regulators, the organizations, you know, the people that should have paid attention to us that haven't. So just wanted to add that. Yeah, and that's a great point, Karen, is that now um, we can bring to the table at the appropriate time or answer the questions at the appropriate time as it relates to trial master file and standards in that regard. And that's part of the Joint Initiative Council is that any one of our members can bring that up. So when we're ready, we'll, we'll go down that pathway. Cool. Next slide. So uh, this really comes from the TMF steer steering committee, but we've used it also. Why would we want to affiliate with uh, TMF and why would CDIS want to do it? Well, certainly we're uh, the global nonprofit clinical research organization, standards development organization. So we already have standing. We've been in that position for a, a, a more than a decade. We promote interoperability. In fact, our mission, uh, we've morphed it in the last year or so to be move away from just the standards development on to the implementation, automation, and interoperability of the standards. Certainly, we have the ability to extend the model and the metadata to provide machine-readable format be part of our, our technology, our metadata registry. We developed the guidance and the implementation documents for the use of standards. That serves as the user guide or the implementation guides for the standards. We've done that for, as I mentioned before, the therapeutic area standards that we've done. We've done it for the FDA, we've done it for PMDA, and for NMPA in China. Uh, we do we have a, a fairly robust uh, standards education on implementation um, uh, of our standards. In fact, we've, um, we, we continue to grow that. It's not just basic uh, education, but it's also advanced education and implementation. We do it in a very, very formats of um, face-to-face -face when we are, are able now to go back to face-to-face -to -face, uh, classroom learning. We also do learning, um, virtual learning and learning management system integration. And finally, uh, the CDISC mission is, has been to make these standards to be freely available for consumption by the industry. Um, it's important for us to uh, come together as an industry to make sure that we promote this interoperability and the, the ability of information to pass from one point in the journey to another point in the journey. And so our standards, the CDISC standards that are out there um, will remain freely available in a number of different formats for, for use. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to transition to talk about why is, what is a standard, right? So I gave this these slides, or some of these slides, as part of the keynote speech at the TMF summit uh, last week. But Webster def defines the standard as either something established by authority or something that's generally acceptable or a level of excellence. So but what we want to do is to focus on the first two. It's either established by authority or essentially mandated or by a regulatory agency, or it's generally accepted. It's market force that we all generally agree that we should do something. And say from CETA's standpoint, the second point, the generally acceptable, is where we went initially back in the late 90s is to come together as an industry to find a common way to exchange information, the nomenclature, the formats, the exchange mechanisms. And it, it, we got, it got us to a point where we now needed to get the regulators involved and uh, FDA particularly, in which they went from um, accepting it and then recommending it and then requiring it. And thus the standard then became the first point, which is established by authority. So the regulatory requirement for clinical research data right now, so FDA, PMDA, and uh, it's recommended by NMPA and looked at uh, from e EMA is that it's the CDISC standard. So the pathway that we went through is the hope of where we want to go with the TMF standard also. Next slide, please. So if we, when we look at clinical research data standards, it's a set of defined data elements, their characteristics and relationships among them. So certainly in, in the data side, the collected data side, that's a CRF. But it's also the rules for creating, managing, and using and verifying the data elements in terms of conformance to what that standard is. And it's a, also a design for combining the data meaningful together that have been collected in many different places and ways. What we think about this is, say, a therapeutic area user guide in which we collect information from a number of different formats and media for a particular disease state. And then this best practice for managing data or a SOP or a, a standard uh, in which to, to do the process. But this generally accepted level of excellence established by authority is essentially what a clinical research standard has to be. Not only is it mandated, but it has to be generally accepted within the industry. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so if we look at, but there's different flavors of standards. There's the clinical concepts and tools that are maybe out there. Um, there's the data exchange standards that, that are in place. Uh, so certainly from the CDIS angle, it's SAS transport data set or a JSON data set, <coughs> excuse me. We have electronic data standards, we have terminology, electronic metadata, the, the, the standards that describe the standards, templates or collections or documents, content, the content that are in those templates, documents and artifacts, and the SOPs and process. So there's different flavors, but they all have to be governed in a way for us to make sure that there's an interoperability that's in place. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And so where do, do, where do we use standards? Well, we can use it in a single project. And we, I think we've all been there where we, we decide we're gonna use this standard for this project so that we understand the, the content for that project. But it quickly goes out of date if you have another, another group within the same firm or in another firm that is doing a similar project and does their standard differently. So, we need to migrate it to be multiple projects or repositories such as data sharing repositories or registries are out there to an indication or or a therapeutic area so for instance oncology or uh, type 1 diabetes or crohn's disease come together as an indication and then as an organization an overall organization whether it be a sponsor organization or a um, uh, a therapeutic area organization multiple organizations, and then finally across industries, government and academia. Now, CDISC, the CDISC standard certainly is at the bottom level right now where it's a, we're being used across industries, bio, uh, uh, biotech, pharma, medical device, soon to be tobacco, 
Um, and also it's mo being moved into academia in which we have independent uh, research trials that are run that are using the CDISC standards. Uh, the hope would be for us to, to follow the same pathway for TMF and to, to get it to the bottom level. Next slide, please. Why standards are needed, I, I don't have to tell you all, uh, but the, the five blue boxes really des describe the challenges, right? So you have homonyms, which may sound the same, but have different meanings, and they have maybe divergent meanings so that you can't, you have to make sure that you understand exactly what you're saying, and that it is a standard, um, meaningful content. You have terminology, the same thing, where you have synonyms, and but you have to agree on what those synonyms are and what the terminology is they use to make merging of data together meaningful, um, and that is uh, in a harmonized way. Definition, so define the, the content, define it in a way to agree what the terms actually mean. Um, what does uh, sex mean? What does... Uh, subject ID mean? What does uh, a document title mean? All those things have to have pure and uh, uh, pure dis defined terminology. We also have relationships. How does one document relate to another one? How does one concept relate to another? So you have these inheritance and relationships that are in place, and they have to also have a standard way of representation. And then finally is organization. So from the data world, how do we create a data set? From the document world, how do you create a set of documents? How do you create a, a folder that has documents in it? Well, all of those have to be an organizational standard. So standards uh, overall facilitate the semantic clarity and organization of the clinical information so they can be shared efficiently, shared efficiently among vendors and service providers and sponsor organizations among sponsors, them, between sponsors, and then sponsors in the regulatory agencies. Next slide, please. <coughs> Next slide, please. Sorry, something's just frozen on my computer. One second, I'm just moving something out of the way for some okay. reason. Um, there you go, sorry about there that. There you go. So what can standards do for you? Um, um, taken this from uh, the TMF group, uh, which essentially is from an efficiency standpoint, interoperability, data reuse, support new science, uh, ethics and safety and quality, is all of the things that I've said before relate to how standards can affect efficiency of data harmonization, data transformation, the data journey, this interoperability between systems, how can we reuse data and data sharing projects and repositories, support new science. Standards are not about, um, not, not about the actual scientific data. It's about making sure that the scientific data is collected and, and reported and analyzed in a way that is, can support new science coming forward. Certainly ethics and safety that, that uh, by having standards in place, you understand what the meaning is, what the definition is, what the relationship is, so that there's no misinterpretation or no misjudgment as to the use of the actual data for analysis and reporting. And then certainly quality. You want to have integrity to data. You want to have a, a traceability to how information is collected to how it finally ends up. And this quality goes without saying that you have to have standards in place for high quality. Next slide, please. So when, from a, a high level, if you look at clinical trial information flow, we start on the left-hand side, and, and in this particular case, we end up at the regulatory agency. So certainly we have a clinical development plan, we have core clinical endpoints that are developed, and then we have these data standards, and from our world, it's the CDISC standards. They all flow into uh, this study design metadata. Well, in the really it's they flow into a clinical protocol and that clinical protocol is the information source that tells us everything that then gets exploded downstream from it meaning that uh, how do we do local registration and approval how do we create all the electronic documents or all the documents and artifacts that are necessary 
the other systems that are used in order to operate clinical trials, such as CTMS and e ETMF and uh, uh, RIM systems. I'll get back to that. Also, the statistical analysis plan, the, the lab services, uh, EPRO, IVRS, EDC, e-learning, all of those different systems all come out of this clinical protocol. Now, in the past, the clinical protocol has been a Word document or, in some senses, an Excel spreadsheet of all the different components that are in there. What CDISC has done with uh, Transcelerate Biopharma is then define this study design metadata or the trial design metadata uh, in order to characterize the metadata associated with each one of the components that would be in a clinical protocol. This allows us now to create a machine readable format in order to create the various uh, configurations for the systems downstream from a clinical protocol. Why is this important? Well, uh, since they're all all this information is flowing from a single point, in the clinical protocol, it now allows us, if we adopt the standard as an industry, um, to better define and become more efficient and have interoperability among all the tools that are out there and the content that is produced by those tools so that as they all come together on the very back end as part of our regulatory submission, that then they can be provided to the agency with high quality, with uh, safety and, and ethics involved, and so that it would then support the new science uh, and also the exchange to the regulatory agencies in a common format. Next slide, please. So uh, the CDIS library is essentially this uh, innovative technology that we put in place. It's been in existence now for a number of years. And uh, what it is, it uh, is a, a repository, a registry of all of our standards, the machine executable content of all those standards, as the foundational standards, as well as controlled terminology. And uh, you'll see in the bottom part where we, we have all of this different content that's in that. Our intention is to now move the trial master file model into the CDIS library and and make it machine readable over time. Why is that important? Well, now we can have API, the APIs that we have in place so that we can connect to digital data processes through these APIs so that those standards can now be machine readable, not just human readable. So CDISC puts this, uh, puts this information out it's, uh, and makes it freely available through our library. And next slide, please. So we want to welcome uh, the TMF reference community to the CDIS Consortium of Clinical Research Standards. We're very excited to have uh, to, to grow the community. Uh, we, we have been part of clinical research, both have been part of clinical research, and now we can come together and promote the use of the information in a standard way, not just from the clinical data side, but also all the information and documentation in a standard way so that we can get uh, that information together so that we can support new science and create efficient processes that are interoperable with one another. So welcome to the TMF community, the CDIS consortium. Karen? Thank you very much, Dave. And I have to say that this picture makes me smile. I love <laughs> seeing the TMF reference model as like really something quite formalized in the middle of all of that. So I, I, I know lots of people will have lots of questions. Um, we will be, um, I just, there's one actually that, that Franz just put in the mm -hmm. box, if you wouldn't mind, before we move on to you, Mary, which is, is there a CDIS standard that re most relates to CTMS? Um, well, certainly the, uh, some of the control terminology that we currently use in order to describe the information, such as studies and the study components, the arms, the epics, and that sort of thing, that serves as foundational standards. Our control terminology that we use out there as part of now this trial design standard will serve as the entre entree or the, the point of entry into CTMS standards. We're having some initial discussions right now with some, uh, some members of the community, the CTMS community, as to how we could maybe uh, evolve standards for that community also. 
So while there's not a direct relationship to the CDISC standards, um, I think what you're seeing is all of this information coming together will then go into all the other systems, such as CTMS or IVRS or EPRO or eConsent systems, and hopefully there'll be one place that the standards are harmonized together for use. Great. Yep. Thank you very much. And, it, and it, it takes time, right? It doesn't happen overnight. But our hope would be in the coming years that this will come about also. Yeah, and we do know it takes time because it's taken yeah. us some time to get to even where we've got to today. But I'm going to hand over. So thank you very much, Dave. Yeah, thank much, you. Much appreciated. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mary, who is on the implementation team. Mary, can you talk us through where we are so far um, and you know how far we how far we've got in terms of tr transition? Sure. Thanks, Karen. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so as you can see here, we have five different areas that we're focusing on with the implementation with CDISC. Um, on the membership side, Karen is handling all of the areas related to membership. So transitioning our TMF reference model community, the change board, the steering committee, transitioning all of that into the CDISC framework. Kathy Clark is handling communications, so you will see future communications coming out about the, um, the implementation of CDIS for the reference model. I'm covering events, so hopefully you'll start to see a few events uh, come through this summer and then more as we get into the fall. There is an event that is scheduled for the end of June, uh, so you'll hear more about that. Uh, Joanne Malia is hand handling the standards, and that is really um, interfacing the change board with the CDISC model and determining how that will be working as, as we complete the affiliation. And then finally, Paul Fenton is handling everything technology. So this includes some of the website aspects, but also the exchange mechanism. Uh, so if you have any questions about these areas, please reach out to the uh, appropriate folks. So if we go to the next slide, Karen. So we did want to give you uh, just an update on our progress so far. So what we've completed is the um, memo, not mem member of understanding, the memo of understanding, sorry, that's my typo, um, that was signed on the 6th of April. So Karen signed that representing all of the TMF reference model steering committee. We then presented to the CDISC board that Friday on April 8th. Uh, so that was the regular, I think Dave, maybe a quarterly meeting for the CDISC board. That's correct. It's a quarterly meeting that we have. Yeah, so we presented there. That was great to meet all of the different members of the CDIS board and uh, really share with them the journey of the TMF reference model. Finally, a CDIS press release came out on April 27th, and that announced the formal affiliation. So hopefully most of you have seen that. And then last week, Dave presented at the TMF summit. So he gave the keynote speech and then the implementation team sat on a panel and answered any questions from the community. Um, upcoming, we do have the membership transition. We'll finalize the governance approach and then finalize the schedule for standards, technology and events. So a lot of work that's going to be happening in the next three to six months as we complete the implementation and the affiliation. Thanks, Karen. Thank you very much, Mary, much appreciated. Um, I wondered if anybody has any specific questions that they'd like to, to put out at this point in time. Um, as I said, there will be a webinar which you're going to have on the 27th of June, where we're really going to get into a lot more of the details. And I think a lot more about uh, over the transition will, will be happening by then. So, but if anybody had any specific concerns or, or questions, I know one of the ones that we saw at the summit was, um, is everything going to remain free in terms of getting the TMF reference model? And yes, everything will remain free. Um, Okay, well, that's great. Thank you very, very much. Very much appreciated. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so, oh, uh, there's a question about the implementation area members' emails. So if somebody could, because I'm now going to be talking, so it would be useful, if somebody could just put all of our emails into that box, that would be much appreciated. Thanks, Vera, for raising that. Okay, so I am going to talk a little bit and a little bit about the impact of the EU CTR on TMF content, a little bit on process. Now, this is based on a webinar that was run by myself, Martina and Russell. Um, and um, I have borrowed one of um, um, uh, Martina's slides. So Martina, I'm going to not, I'm going to just touch on it briefly. If there's anything you want to add as I get through, feel free. Um, and really this is just to give you an idea of what we talked about. This is not to give you the full remit. If you want to find out exactly what was said, there will be a white paper written at some stage, but equally there is a two hour um, webinar. Um, the before I go into, um, into that, I'd like to just run a couple of very quick polls. And the reason I want to run these polls is because we run them at a number of different times. So we ran them at the, and I'm going to launch them now, hopefully you can see them. Um, we ran them at um, uh, the workshop we did. And the workshop was about 100 people. And we kept saying to everybody in the workshop, make sure that the people who attend the workshop are those that are actively involved with the EU CTR, <clears throat> etc. Then we ran the same poll at the uh, TMF Summit. So for those of you who are in New Orleans and who are um, enjoying Bourbon Street and as well as TMF um, last week, um, we ran the same, the same uh, questions. And the answers were pretty similar. Um, and I'm interested to see how the answers turn out this time. Please do all answer. There's 106 of you on the call. Um, if you don't know, it's fine. I'd rather know that you don't know, because I think it's one of those things, especially if you, you know, you might be a US focused company where the EU CTR has very little impact because you don't run trials over there. Um, you might be a consultant, you might be and not involved in this side of the world as well. Um, but it's nice to know. But it's interesting is it's about the same proportion. So I'm going to ask. Uh, yes, absolutely. So there's a question, uh, um, Jane Marie Eldon. Jane Marie's asked if you can post the link to the webinar. Could you put it in the, in the chat again, if you wouldn't mind, please? Thank you very much. And um, I'm going to ask Russell or Eldon, when I end these polls and launch them, could you take screenshots, please? Whoever, whoever's... Um, whoever's got it, got their computer and free between if I ask two of you, we should be fine. Um, thank you. So first question is, and, and about 75% of people answered, has your company assessed the impact? Yes. In progress. No. And I don't know. Really, really similar. There's a lot of people who haven't actually done much assessment, but there's quite a lot of assessment ongoing. And then the other question is, where are you collating the documents? Um, between ETMF, regulatory, both ETMF and regulatory, I don't know, and not applicable. So again, a very, very, very mixed bag. And that's interesting because that does really have an impact on the content of the TMF um, as we'll go through and, um, and I will highlight that as we go through. Okay, so. What does the EU CTR say about TMFs? Not a huge amount. And as I said, Russell and, and, and Martina, if you want to, to jump in and add any comments, um, I am literally summarizing what was two hours, which we condensed into half an hour. I'm now condensing into about 12 minutes. So, but if there's anything you think are important I miss out, then let me know. So what does the EU CTR say about TMFs? Not a huge amount. 
Um, it's got this sentence where it says it's got to have the relevant documentation and allow for effective supervision um, and kept by a sponsor and investigator and archive it properly. Um, nothing is particularly new there. If you go into the act, into Article 57, um, it says that it should at all times contain essential documents. In all honesty, we know that because timeliness is a big thing people worry about. Uh, readily available and directly accessible. I think everyone knows that in Europe, specifically, there's direct access. And I have to say, from my experience, uh, the FDA is getting more and more and more into direct access as well. So I think my recommendation is always assume you have to give direct access. And they'll be pleasantly surprised if you don't. Um, and it talks about investigators and sponsors having different content. Um, justified by the different natures. Now, very important thing to point out here is relating back to what Dave was presenting. One of the things that came out in the, the, um, the TMF summit was around, well, what about the investigator site files, the investigator documents? And I think that um, because we are now moving to a standards-based world, because we have so many more links, I think there's gonna be quite a bit more focus on the investigator side of things. Um, up until now, we've sort of mapped things and I think it might become a bit more, bit more structured from moving forward. Um, definitely not, not um, I'm not the expert on the call on, on the archiving, archiving side of things, because we've obviously got Eldon and Russell and Jamie and a variety of other people who are um, experts at archiving, but the, the EU CTR obviously has this uh, 25 years that's now come into play. Uh, we have been talking about it for six, seven years, but it's now finally there. Interesting, Canada reduced theirs at the same time that we've, in Europe, see part of Europe, increased ours. Um, and it talks a lot about archiving of, um, and the, the, the way in which you can archive. It talks about um, making sure things are readily available. Um, and there's quite a lot about different um, media that needs to be stored, et cetera. Um, I think it's what, well, the interesting thing I noticed, which we talked about at the summit as well, was the fact that there isn't a, a mention of a nominated archivist. They sort of just talk about somebody has to be responsible for the archives, um, which changes things in, in Europe slightly because a nominated archivist was definitely a thing that we were trying to, we were trying to comply with. Um, Anyway, so that's what the EU CTR says about TMFs. Um, this is Martina's slide. So Martina, I, 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 I'm only going to gloss over it. If you wanna hear Martina's excellent interpretation of the slide, then um, go and listen to the webinar. But I think the, the, having listened to Martina presented a couple of times, the thing that really hits me here is the fact that it's a really big change. It's, it's the biggest change that we've had in terms of regulations and clinical trials in a very long time. And it's taking everything from being very individual and very uh, fluctuating between countries um, to bringing it all together and having it as a much more streamlined approach. Um, and, and so basically, it's it's it is absolutely changing how we approach approvals of clinical trials in Europe. I think the other thing that's interesting that I, that it, that came out of this is how things are being um, reported. the The concept of events. So there's a lot more um, uh, documentation that comes out of. The, the submission process and the approval process, because there's a lot of event reporting that has to happen. But what impact does that have on the TMF? I'll, I'll go through that in a few minutes. The other thing I think that's interesting is the very last point, which is around information submitted to the CTS will be published. So this whole concept of um, redacted and non-redacted documents, uh, which again, um, affects the whole content of the TMF. So, there's a much, much better explanation on the whole thing on the webinar. So I'm going to keep doing a boost for the webinar. And hopefully Russell and Martina will have that number 49 up to 150 soon. So let's just talk very quickly in the last few minutes about 
the new or changed document types. And having done this webinar or this workshop, I should say, for two hours, we sort of came to the conclusion that the process has changed, but the outcome is very similar. So huge change in process, centralizing everything, ethics and regs brought together, events reporting, etc. But actually, the outcome is similar. So therefore, the types of documents that come out are very similar and can be mapped. There were some new sub artifacts suggested. Um, there was quite a lot of discussion around duplication of documents. So and as I go through the different document types, I'll explain what I mean by that. So what's the reference model impact? Well, there are sort of big headline impacts. So for example, um, when you fill in the CTIS, the, which is obviously the European, for those of you who I haven't explained that to, that is the European database where all the regulatory submissions go in, which doesn't have an API. So you have to put everything in manually. But hopefully they'll change that one day. Um, a lot of people are doing things like having spreadsheets to collect all the data, which is like source data really for what's going into the CTIS. And the question is, does that have to go in the TMF? Now, we don't have the answers for that because it really does depend on where you're collecting the information, where you're housing the information and where you are sort of feeding that information into the CTIS system from. If it's all from your TMF, you might have everything. And I know um, uh, Martina talks about uh, that, that, that at Bayer they're putting everything into, into, the, um, into the TMF. There are other companies where things are going mostly coming mostly from the regulatory systems or from both, as you saw from the survey. The next sort of big question that came out was this whole redacted versus non-redacted. So the redacted is because you might have company personal information that, that or not sorry, company private information or personal information, things like that, that you don't want out in the public. So therefore you would redact the versions that get published through the CTIS. But obviously the redacted versions aren't needed for the TMF. And in fact, for the TMF, you probably want to have the non-redacted version. So the question is, do you put both versions into the TMF? Again, something to be answered based on where you keep the documents. There was a lot of discussion about tagging of documents for the CTR. So people going in and actually using either their TMF or their reg system or both and having metadata specifically to say this is a CTR document. And the other place, which really goes back to the whole duplication is, is the whole CTA filed on the TMF? So when you uploaded the CTA, or into the CTIS system, you can then download the whole thing as a zip. Do you take that and put it in your TMF? And if you do, then is that duplication? Or else where are you gonna put it? You're gonna put it somewhere. Um, again, these are more questions that you need to be answering. <clears throat> when you get to specifics, um, and I'm not gonna go through all the specifics in great detail, but when you get to specifics, things like there was all the, the submission evidence um, so evidence of what's gone in to into into um, uh, the system and maybe there was suggestions around some sort of new sub artifact. Now, what we're going to do is take all this information, feed it through to the change control board. The change control board are going to go, OK, and take a proper look at this and decide what they want to do and come out in version 3.3 or whatever is going to come out next. Um, there was a lot of notifications. So from from the the there's a lot of different events and the events all provide notifications notifications are still happen today so there's notifications from um fda etc they get filed in the tmf so there's places to put them it's just there's a huge volume in terms of and change in terms of of what the number and the extent that you're getting stuff back there were a couple of um new sub artifacts proposed one for the protocol synopsis for laypersons and one for the clinical trial summary report for laypersons. Um, both were suggested to go into the protocol synopsis and clinical trial summary report artifacts. Big debate about should we consider putting them into what gets given to patients? Um, but we decided that actually they're not patients, they're laypersons, and that's where you'd logically look for them. So go to the webinar and have a listen if you wanna hear the debate around that. Um, discussion, a lot of discussion about batch certificates and where they should be stored. 
uh, batch records, QP certification. Uh, we talked about IMPD. I don't know if anybody remembers, but IMPD was an artifact, then it wasn't, then it became a sub artifact. So it's gone in and out because the IMPD obviously goes across multiple trials. So people go, well, if it goes across multiple trials, should it really be in the TMF? But I think like the IB, people thought, well, yes, the IMPD should. Um, however, um, there is um, reference to two different types of IMPDs, one for quality, one for safety and efficacy. Um, should there be separate sub artifacts? I think the general consensus was no, but it, it wasn't a definite, absolutely. Safety, I don't think we thought there was a huge change in the safety, but that would need to go to the safety uh, group for them to have a look at at that because there are unexpected events that affect the benefit risk balance that need to be recorded, but there's places to put them in, in the reference model. Annual safety report, I didn't think there was a problem there. There was a bit of debate about the compliance with biological samples. So this was more a, <coughs> excuse me, more a plan of how you're gonna manage the biological samples rather than actually you know, uh, the, the sample tracking themselves. And the potentially a new artifact there, we didn't really get to the bottom of that, we, we actually ran out of time. <coughs> oh, excuse me, apologies. Then there's a couple of links, so thank you. <coughs> Kathy, I think you put these links up. Hi, this is Kathy. Um, this is just a, some background information because it seems like the topics of um, what needs to, what can and, should be redacted um, and uh, how um, personal data should be handled are, are actually quite complex. And if they're not handled properly, your requests will be refused. So these are some guidance documents that I found. One of them, as you can see, is quite recent and the other one is not. Um, but hopefully that will help people in making their decisions about how uh, to formulate their redacted copies and uh, how to how to ensure that they, those will be um, acceptable to the authorities. Yeah, and I think if it comes to reduction of commercially confidential information, we already have some experience with, or companies already have some experience with information from uh, trial reports, which have to be submitted to authorities like Health Canada and where you have proper guidance, what is con accepted as confidential by authorities. However, if you are doing a trial application, you are early in your development program and it's more which might be confidential, which then gives you two options perhaps to, and, and instead of doing all of this reduction, you may defer a document because you say, well, within the development program, so in the next couple of years, it will be public anyway. And you can ask for a deferral, which will be granted if reasonable. Um, yeah, with, with respect to the PPD, so the personal protected data, I mean, this is the GDPR and we are all meanwhile used to handle this. It's, we, we really have to take this with care because we have not been used that information which we are submitting to authorities will be public, but it's now the case. And, it's a good guidance. Yes, thank you, Kathy. It's it, it's worth to to read through. And I think there might be one more concept, and I haven't studied this in detail, but there may be a difference between a for publication copy and a redacted copy in some cases, where a for publication might be a version that's actually created for publication as opposed to a redacted one is the original with information obscured in it. Yeah, and if, if frankly spoken, you always have to upload a for publication version. And only if you ha have uploaded a for publication version where you use the need to protect certain data, your company data or personal data, um, only then you can upload the non for publication version, which is then for the authorities and ethics committees to, to perform their reviews. Thanks, guys. I'm really sorry. I'm at the end of a COVID thing, and I thought I might get through the whole meeting without having a coughing fit. I did most of it, so thank you very much, Martina and Kathy, for stepping in. Um, luckily, we're at the end of time, and <coughs> the only thing left to talk about is any TMF-related events. 
these are the three we've got. Um, does anybody know any others? If you do, can you email feedback at tmfreferencemodel.com? And at that, with that, dead on time, and I'm really sorry, I'm definitely not putting my camera back on. Um, <coughs> the next meeting is the 27th of June. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and apologies for my little collapse at the end. Take care, everybody, and I will see you soon. Thanks all.